their thoughts are you know the activity of their lives bless everything about my neighbor right now god i pray everything they touch would be blessed i pray god you would keep them keep them from hurt harm and danger i come against every scheme every device every attack of the enemy i pray victory over my neighbor's life in the name of the lord jesus cover their home cover their families keep them in good health and now god open up your word to us that we can live and not die that when we leave here we're better than how we came pray god that you would give us information for our heads we are thinking people inspiration for our hearts we are feeling people and implementation for our hands that the testimony of us may be we are doing people heal and deliver according to your word save for your name's sake speak lord we're listening in jesus name amen hallelujah amen I, you remain standing turn with me to acts chapter one i and i'll start reading at verse four i want to I want to spend, I want to start the year in the book of Acts. And so I want to spend some time here as the Lord will speak to us in the book of Acts. Um, and just so you know, Bible study starts back at the Rocky Mount campus tomorrow night, on Tuesday night. And I'm going to be this year teaching on how to foolproof your life. And I'm going to be doing combinations of topical messages and book of Proverbs. So I'm going to teach all year on the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to open the year talking about Sabbath, rest, and rhythms, and how we make sure we have good balance in our life so we're not working ourselves to death. We have good outlet, and then I'm going to switch back and forth between those topics and the book of Proverbs. So I think it's going to be a blessing this year. I'm looking forward to teaching it. So Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or season which the Lord has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? And this same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Amen. Before you take your seat, would you look at somebody? I want you to just give somebody a message real quick on your way down. Look at them, smile at them, find somebody. Tell them, neighbor, you have great potential. Amen, amen. You can have your seat. I Stay with me for a moment. I want to preach living up to your potential. Living up to your potential. As a pastor, as a man, as a father, for me, just for me, very little can be as discouraging and disappointing as knowing that your children, your members, your community, your church are not living up to their full potential. Well, when you know people have more in them. You're not quick to be excited about the C your child brings home when you know they have greater potential. I, I want to argue today that we have greater potential than we realize. 
as the physician Luke writes the book of Acts, it is a complimentary book, if you will, to his gospel. He even references it in chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1, he says, the former account that I made, the former account that he's referencing is the gospel of Luke. And as he says, the former account that I made, O Theophilus, he says, of all that Jesus, everybody say, began. That's where the potential is. He says, I began writing with you with all that Jesus began. And the reality of it, the truth of the matter is this is what he's saying. For all that you have experienced with God so far, God is really just beginning. And I want to go ahead and minister that so it blesses somebody. I know you think everything that's going on is mighty awesome and mighty special, and it may have some merit to it. It might be awesome and it might be special, but just keep in mind that God is only just beginning. That so everything that's happening with your marriage or with your, 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 your career or with your ministry, all the things that are happening in your life, God is only just beginning, he says. Y'all, he says, so he says, we begin now learning about the church from the book of Acts. And as we learn about the church from the book of Acts, what I want you to understand, and this is why it's so important for us to be in church, is that everything that we learn in here is transferable and portable. It's not just designed to make me a better Christian. It's designed to make me a better person. Say amen if you can. It, I, I'm not just coming up in here to learn how to pray. I'm coming up in here also to learn how to be a better husband, to learn how to be a better business person, to learn how to be a better community member. That when we come to church to be developed, remember, the potential is put in me by God. It is then realized by Jesus. And then it is cultivated by his bride, which is the church. So when we come to church, he is really cultivating for us and nurturing for us the potential that is in us. But the problem is, if we're not careful, we can reduce how we see church. Some of us just see it as a building. Some of us just see it as a corporation. Some of us just see it as a, as a needs meeting entity like the Red Cross or the United Way. And some of us see it like some obligation of duty. And some of us see it just as a calendar of activities. But the truth of the matter is the church is us. And, and, and so God is showing us now in the book of Acts what church really looks like. And, and y'all, let me just say this for all of our lives, whether it's growing as a Christian whether it's being a business owner, whether it's being a school teacher, whether it's being a husband or wife, whatever the case is, fundamentals, everybody say fundamentals. Fundamentals are necessary. That means if I'm going to grow and be developed, there's some fundamental things that we have to do. And you know, one of the things I'm learning, y'all, is that most stuff I need doesn't require a miracle. I know, I mean, I, think about it. Most stuff, if I get to a point where I need a miracle, it's generally because I've not done a good job of cultivating the basics. But if I'm fundamentally doing the stuff God has called me to do, and this is the reason I'm ministering this, because I, I want to take the mystery out of the Christian life. I want to take the mystery out of the things of God. That God is really much simpler than we realize. And that when God wants us to grow, it doesn't take us. I don't need to be super gifted and super talented and have. I don't need to know all the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Aramaic. Let me help y'all. Can I just park here for a moment? If I just know English and just can read what's in the book. I may not have all the other languages down pat, but if I can just do the basics, if I can just consistently pray and consistently fast and consistently commit myself and consistently serve, there is a blessing that is attached to us doing the fundamentals. And y'all, over and over again, I'm amazed by how many people, you know, let y'all in a little secret, Phil. I mean, I haven't done a whole lot anymore. As a matter of fact, I'm about to get it taken apart um, and put in storage, but you know, my, you know, there was a time in my life where I could shoot a pretty good, you know, rack of pool, pool balls. Matter of fact, it's partly how I got through college. I'll let y'all piece all that together. Oh, and so I grew up shooting pool. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I'm really telling family business now, uh, my, my, my parents would, would, would play the numbers. Not the lottery. The numbers. Some of y'all don't understand what that is. It, and, and it's really the street number. And in Philadelphia, it was based on the horse races. 
And so they would put in, you know, they put in, you know, you, they would, you go to the fish market. And after you bought your fish, you say, uh, give, me, give me 312 a dollar over a quarter. <laughs> and so, and so, so one year, my mama around Christmas time hit the street number. I was 10 years old, best Christmas of my life. And, and she picked a pool table, I'm really aging myself. She picked a pool table out the Sears catalog. And she got rid of the dining room set and she put the pool table in the dining room. And whenever we wanted to eat, they had some boards my father would put on top of it and we'd eat. She put a tablecloth over it, it doubled as dining room table. My mom had some wisdom because that pool table kept me out the street. And so I started shooting pool 10 years old. And I would shoot 30, 40, 50 racks of balls a day. I would shoot all into the night, going somewhere. What made me a good shooter was consistently practicing the same shots over and over again. So that when the time came for me to shoot the shot in the game, what looked like a difficult shot was one that you had already practiced over and over again. That in order to be good at anything, it doesn't require that we be exceptional. It requires that we understand the basics. And when we fundamentally do the things that God has called us to do, that is when our best selves begin to emerge. And when we begin looking at the book of Acts, we start to see example upon example about the necessity of fundamentals as a, as a practice. And as I preach today, I'm going to give you four of them very quickly. But the second thing I want to say just to introduce this text is that we have to understand the ministry of intentionality. Tell your neighbor, be intentional. You know, I'm learning that anything that I want to do is not... Christians don't wish. I want to get that synced in. I say Christians don't wish. I, I wish things would get better. I wish me and my wife were happier. I wish my child wasn't this way. You don't need to wish. That's what unbelievers do. You know, wishing upon a star, wishing things were different. As believers, we can be intentional and purpose and, and, and deliberate about what God wants my life to look like. I don't have to wish to get out of debt. I can purposely and intentionally do what God has called me to do to get out of debt. I don't have to wish I was healthier. I can willfully and intentionally and purposely and deliberately exercise and drink more water and eat better. I can I don't have to be I don't have to wish my life better and we begin looking at the book of Acts we start to see the purposefulness the intentionality the deliberate nature by which the people of God began to systematically move in the direction that God has called them to move so think about this for a moment we're in church no no don't 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 miss we're in church. If there was ever an organization that should have failed, it was the church. Think about it. Jesus shows up on the scene like nobody else. You got to remember, we all loving on him now. When Jesus was on the earth, he had as many people that disliked him as he did like them. He, he, he's showing up. He, he topping over kingdoms. He, he challenging Caesar. He, he making Pontius Pilate nervous. He, he's making Herod uncomfortable. Here he is, y'all, toppling over systems. And here he is, y'all, starting this new movement, doing stuff folk never heard of before, showing up with just a handful of people. He, he, he's, so, he's making people so nervous. He start with 12 people. And then before you know it, he's on the mountaintop and on the hillside preaching to 5,000 folks, 6,000 folks, 10,000 folk. Every time you look up, the, 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 the witchcrafts and the naysayers are all upset because, because he's putting them all out of business. The, the hospitals are mad because every time he show up, you know, folk getting healed. You know, blind people starting to see. All the eye doctors in town all bent out of shape. And all the, all the trauma surgeons upset because he's healing people and, and he's making all this stuff go on. And then in the movement, in the highlight of it, three years into it, he dies. And you would think 
that the movement would have stopped. But the reality of it is it kept going. And the reason it kept going is because there was a word in the scriptures that, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And can I go ahead and minister to somebody? If you are saved in this room, then you are the church. And if you are the church, hell might come for you. And sickness might show up and knock at your doorstep. And difficulty might be your neighbor from time to time. But I'm going to minister and prophesy over your life. We're going to be fine. Matter of fact, tell somebody you're going to be fine. See, it's in the church that we can have confidence that the winds may come and the storms may show up. But I have confidence that I'm going to be fine. I know God is going to make a way. Y'all remember that song? He's going to make a way somehow. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't. Have you ever lived your life in such a time where you didn't really know how God was going to do it? But you look back over your life. And some kind of way, God opened the door. Some kind of way, God made a way. You looked up and you found yourself better than you realized because as a believer, you're going to be fine. Yes. And I want somebody to get that going into 2023. And understand this about church. A big chunk of what's going to happen in your life and my life is going to be what comes out of your mouth when you leave here. Oh my, 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 my. You got to make up in your mind. It's one thing to hear, hear me preach. And say amen. But it's another thing that when I get to the door talking about, well, I don't really know what it's going to look like. Well, there you go. I guess you won't know what it's going to look like. But if you're a believer, you better open up your mouth and say, you know what? Times are a little bit different, but I trust God. I don't really know how this thing is going to work out, but I'm believing he's going to make a way. I really don't have this thing all figured out, but I know he is going to figure this thing out for me. And so I've got confidence in him. See, it's only in the church that you can say, I'm going to be fine. Let me minister to somebody real quick. You already have been through your own worst thing for you. Everybody in this room has had a, I wasn't planning for this moment. Hello, somebody. Everybody has had what I call an all things moment. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. We, we've all had that moment, y'all, where I'm like, this is the worst thing could have happened for me. But yet, here you are. You, you, you've already survived your worst thing. You say, well, Pastor, another worst thing may come. It may. But you already have a track record with God in bringing you through your own worst thing. So and look at your neighbor. Tell him, I've already gotten through a lot. I, see, that's why this year you don't have to be bent out of shape, Phil, when the bottom falls out and things are not. See, I, I'm so grateful to God. One of the things I never do. Is, is play the I wish my life had been different game. I don't play that game. Because let me tell you what I've learned. It's everything attached to my life, the good and the bad, that has helped form me and make me into who God wants me to be. And so I don't say, I really wish I had not gone through that. I'm grateful for the stuff we went through. Because I went through that, when hell hits my house in this, in this season, I can have confidence that, you know what? The same God that brought me through that is the same God that's going to get me through what I'm going through right now. And y'all, this is why you got to be careful. See, I feel bad for folk that don't have no testimony. Let me tell you something. All that, I ain't never had no real rough time in my life. You better pray about that testimony. Because, see, some of us got a track record with God. And, see, I've been through some stuff. That's why sometimes, I, can I just say I minister this? I, I, I'm always, see, I've been cautious out here. Because y'all different. So I had to be careful. Y'all get offended easy. But you can handle it. You can handle something. So, so this is why we got to be careful that as parents, we are not working so hard to protect our children from everything. Uh, they need some hard love. They need to bump their head sometime. They need to have some disappointments and failures. Because the quicker they experience them and get on the other side of them, the quicker they're going to realize what's in them and what God is capable of doing. But if they go off to college and they ain't never had a rough moment, I had this conversation with my daughter, spending all my money on my Amazon account. I'm looking up. She got Whole Foods delivering to the, to the campus. I said, I don't even eat at Whole Foods. I got a job. She said, Dad, I need something to eat. I said, 
Oodles or noodles are $1.25. And you need, you got hot water, and you just need a dollar and you ate. And, and, and see, some of us don't recognize, y'all, that you need to have them oodle of noodles moments so that you can recognize that God can get you through anything. Do I have a handful of people that didn't always have it all laid out for you, but you had to accept whatever God put on the plate and be thankful to God for it? Man, sometimes you got to put water in your cereal or eat them dry until you can afford some milk. And I guarantee you, if you do that, you'll enjoy the milk better once you went without it than you... Oh. See, some of us can't really appreciate everything God has done because you haven't had a season without it. But you go ahead and live long enough where you didn't have what you had. When you finally get it, you're going to learn to thank God so much more for it. Oh, God. So, so the church feels like, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. I ain't going to bore y'all with all my testimony stuff. But, but I, I, I tell y'all this. This is real talk. I came here without a suit. 17 years ago, I came here without a suit. My very first suit, and it took everything in me because I wore it to death. The only suit I owned, I bought from Walmart in Rocky Mountain. It was navy blue, pinstripe. Folks be like, man, that's a nice suit, Pastor. I'll be playing it up. When you learn to appreciate where God brings you from and what God does in your life, that when he begins to do more, you don't have the big head. You just have a testimony of appreciation that it was not always this way. And God, I want to thank you. See, what I'm trying to get you to have in your spirit that is in the church where we develop a mindset of we're going to make it. It's here that we get a mindset of we're going to be fine. Because the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Church. You're the church. That's the kind of potential in us. And so let me share very quickly what this potential realized. How it, does it get realized, Audrey? Real, and this is going to be portable. T- tell your neighbor the word is portable. Huh? That, that, that means it's going to work for your marriage. It means it's going to work in your business. It means it's going to work for how you handle your money. It's going to work in every... You can put a handle on the word and carry it out of here. Four quick observations. Number one. In order for us to realize our potential, I have to recognize that I need a supernatural foundation. A supernatural foundation. He begins to say in verses 1 and 2, the the, the pericope says prologue. He says the the initial account, the former account I made of Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day which he was taken up, where he presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs. When he says he presented himself alive after his suffering to many infallible proofs, he's after his suffering. When he presented himself, that means he was presenting himself post-resurrection. Which means he's saying at the beginning, don't miss this. Because I'm so sick of people thinking that what makes the church strong is speaking in tongues. The power they talk about in the Holy Spirit. I'll deal with that this month. The church is strong because it has a supernatural foundation. It is based upon Jesus who is resurrected from the dead. Why does that matter? Because that means we are standing on a foundation where resurrection is always possible. I don't care how down you get. Get back up is possible. I don't care how hard it gets. Getting back up is possible because we are standing on a supernatural foundation. And I think too often times in our life, we minimize the resurrected person of Jesus as our foundation. My foundation is not James Galliard. If your foundation is, your, is you, you for your marriage, you in trouble in your marriage. 
Because all of us are too weak to hold anything that matters. God can't build on my foundation. The Bible teaches us that the church is built on the foundations of the apostles. Foundation of the word. He says the supernatural foundation of Jesus. He has presented himself alive after his suffering to many infallible proofs. It's the supernatural foundation of Jesus. The church is the ultimate place of get back up again. Folk, folk don't get divorced. Don't, folk don't get divorced because they have marriage problems. They get divorced because those problems stand on the wrong foundation. Once Jesus becomes your foundation, I'm going to speak this over the room. It's going to bless somebody who's ready to receive it. Once Jesus is your foundation, whatever you're dealing with, you can handle it. He can bless you. See, the resurrected person of Jesus is my foundation. See, let me say it like this. It all stands on salvation. See, see, the hardest thing he can do is get me saved. Some of y'all miss it. it the, the, the biggest work. This, see, this, this is why it blows my mind. You know, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to a church where there's signs and wonders. Let me, let me go ahead kill this demon real quick. Every time somebody surrenders their life to the Lord, that's the biggest sign and wonder you're going to ever see. Boy, I wish I had a handful of people that can be... All the other stuff is less than that. Yeah. So the heavy lift is getting me right. right. <laughs> the, the heavy lift is taking you from sin to salvation. Healing your little body, that's easy. Come on, getting my mind from being confused, that's easy. Keeping me out of hell is the problem. Now listen to me. Once we get that foundation right... The rest is easy. I serve because I'm saved. That's easy. Well, I, 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 I sacrifice because I'm saved. It's easy. I steward the things God has given me because I'm saved. And so the, the first initial thing here is there has to be a supernatural foundation to my job. So can I go ahead and minister this? I'm going to go ahead and minister it. So you know, we, have, we have a bunch of school teachers in our churches, both campuses, educators. Always have. I think because the early days of our ministry, and now that we're out of COVID, we'll get back to doing more of this. We always did a lot of, like, teacher appreciation events, you know, and so that's how we minister to teachers. So we have a lot of educators. And so I, I made this comment earlier, and I'm going to make it to all of you. Listen, it is entirely okay. For you to show up, get you some oil, and anoint your desk. It, 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 look, it, I'm, I'm fine with there's some oil coming down the keyboard. It, it's all right for you to anoint your child before they leave home. It's all right for you to anoint your husband and say, Lord, bring my husband back home safely tonight. Y'all, we, it's all right to stand out front of the high school and anoint the flagpole and say in the name of the, it's all right for folk to come to your office or your cubicle and wonder why you got some grease on the side because I'm standing on a supernatural foundation. Because let me tell you something, you got demons at work. Hello, somebody. You got demons on your job. Some of y'all like, I know you're scared to say amen too loud. Some of y'all bosses are demons. Some of your clients are demons. Some of your people are around you. And I need a supernatural foundation where I'm anointing that thing. And in the name of Jesus, I'm standing at work. And in the name of Jesus, I'm cutting hair. And in the name of Jesus, I'm coaching kids. In the name of Jesus, I'm doing what I'm doing. It has to be a supernatural foundation. Anoint your nightstand. Shoot, anoint your bed. Oh, my married folk. Come on, I need this to be supernatural. Some of y'all get that next week. Come on, I, I want, so it starts with a supernatural. He says, he opens up, don't miss all these chapters we're going to go through in the book of Acts. 
Don't miss where it starts. It starts with him, Jesus, presenting himself after suffering to infallible proofs. That means he presented himself post-resurrection, which he is showing that everything after this is standing on a supernatural foundation. Here's the second thing. Not only is this supernatural foundation, but number two, I need to recognize that I have a specific assignment. A specific assignment. Ooh, this is going to bless somebody if it don't bless nobody but James Gale here. He says in verse 8, here's your assignment. Be witnesses to me. Now, let me, let me set somebody free. <laughs> let me set somebody free. Um, 2023, stay in your lane. Matter of fact, matter of fact, look at somebody. And I'm, I'm going to teach you, just get this off. Just get it out. Just get it out. I want you to get it. I want you to learn how to say this. Just look at somebody and say, that's not my assignment. I, I want you to get that thing in your spirit. Now, because can I tell you what will mess us up every time is being in business that's not ours. And being in a marriage that's not ours. Come on, being all up in it, that's not ours. He gives them a specific assignment because nobody is anointed to do everything. And the moment I recognize God did not call me to that, do you know how many conversations we're in that we didn't get called into? Jesus. Preach Pastor Gallier. Come on, some stuff don't need what you think about it. I don't think nothing about it because it ain't my assignment. And I don't need to know what's happening in your bedroom. I don't need to know what happened, what's going on. That's your business. I'm going to let you keep your assignment. Because let me tell you something. I'm working hard on my assignment. And I'm barely surviving this thing. I don't have enough energy, enough time, enough emotion, and enough resources to get in your assignment too. I was sharing, I was sharing. And the same thing is here now. You know, started the church 17 years ago. And actually, when I started my very first church, this is funny. Started my very first church in Philly. Our sound system was so old that it had tubes in the amp, right? So we had tubes in the amp, you know, so that I could figure that out because that's like a light bulb, right? So you could look at a tube and see it's blown. Just put another one in. That ain't rocket science, right? And so I knew how to turn the system on. But as the church has evolved on this campus as well, if something happened to Rhonda, one of these jokers, we're going to be without sound, Maybe some of the core team could figure that out. They know how to do it. I'm going somewhere. Not that I can't learn it, but I, it's going to affect my preaching because that's not my assignment. And I think, can I, can I go ahead and minister this point for somebody? Some of us would be better at our assignment if we would stop trying to do other people's assignment. That you'd be more effective in what God has called you to do. You ain't that good at singing to be up in my preaching business. You ain't that good at what God has called you to do to be up in everybody. Stick to your assignment. He says, look, this is the assignment. The first part of the assignment, go tell folk about me. And that's what we all should be doing. Every Sunday, we should see first-time visitors. Every Sunday, we should be telling people all week long about how good God is. And let me tell you one of the mistakes we can make. He says, he doesn't say, he doesn't say the assignment is to witness about Word Tabernacle. Yeah. Let me tell you, one of the worst, somebody gonna be so convicted and so mad, you might, one of the worst invitations is come hear my pastor. Right. You ain't called to witness to James Gallier. <laughs> we are called to be witnesses of Jesus. So what, the te what I should be telling is look, God is changing people's lives. And you need to see folk different. Folk, I know some folk, boy, they used to cuss. They don't cuss nearly as much. They still cuss a little bit, but they, God is working that thing down. He walking that thing back. He, come on, anybody here a little bit better in any area of your life? Like, God, I'm not there all the way, but as I am learning to be sinless, I'm starting to sin a little bit less, and I'm getting better as I go. That's the testimony. Look at God moving. That folk all see you at work saying, but you're different. Folk all see you around and say, man, the stuff that used to boil you, man, don't, you don't even pay no attention to. 
Right. So the first assignment for them was to tell. The second assignment for them was to teach. And, and so Minister Dwight making that reference about small groups and, and church and study groups, because that's what we've been called to do. We've been called to teach, y'all. We've been called to develop and become nurturers and, and to develop and grow in the word. And then the last thing they have, they've been called to do, I'm trying to hurry because I just want to give you these last two points, is they, they were called to tarry. Where, where my old church folk at? He says, he says, in verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come. And I don't have time, y'all, to unpack this because I'm trying to, trying to get us to the end. But, 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 but he says, look, there's going to be a period before the Holy Spirit descends upon you. There's going to be a moment. It's actually, and again, I, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but Pentecost, let me just teach for a minute. Pentecost was referred to as the Feast of Weeks. So Pentecost was always 50 days after Passover. When you go back, the Lord had taken it take him 40 days after the resurrection to be ascended. So after his resurrection, he walks on the earth 40 days and then he's ascended. Pentecost is the, fifth, is the feast of weeks, which is the 50th day after Passover. Which means because he took him 40 days to ascend and the, and, and, and the Pentecost is the feast of weeks, which is the 50th day, they got to wait 10 days. Now, that's powerful because some of us don't want to wait 10 minutes for the Lord to move. We have to learn to tarry. You got to learn to wait on him. You, you got to learn to say, Lord, you know what? I'm not walking away. I'm just going to wait on you. And let me just say this, y'all. Let me just say this. Hope this will bless somebody. Waiting is not inactivity. Waiting is not doing nothing. Waiting is preparation for what God is doing. I think some of us don't have what we really want to have because while we're in that waiting period, we're not doing nothing. Waiting, all right, let me put it in a way where y'all can get it. Until I'm, while I'm waiting to get the house, I can be working on my credit. While I'm waiting to get the house, I can be saving up my deposit. While I'm waiting to be able to afford the new wardrobe, I can buy some hangers. That I can make up in my mind that God, you're going to do something. While, while I'm trusting to lose this weight, I'm going to go get a dress size in the size I'm trying to get to. Because I believe you're going to do it. And sometimes that's what you need is a motivation. Sometimes you need to look at something and say, I'm going to get in that. That the time is going to come for that to happen in my life. So it's not that I'm doing nothing. It's that I am preparing while God is doing. I think oftentimes in our life, we don't see the move of God just because he peeping in and saying, she ain't ready. Like, you, you ain't ready for no husband. You looked at your room lately? You, how you, you ain't ready for no wife. You broke by yourself. It, so God is saying, Terry is part of all of our assignments. This is learning to wait on him. All right, let me, let me take this to the end. Y'all been patient. Number three. We need a safe place. Everybody say a safe place. If you notice in verse 12, after the super, supernatural foundation, the specific assignment, he shows that they have a safe place. Then they return from Jerusalem. This is verse 12 of chapter 1. And they return to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet. And the Bible says they enter into the upper room. And they enter into the upper room and they enter in with people they feel safe around. And I want to park here for a minute and encourage all of us. That in order for God to do great things in our life, 
We need to get around people that we feel safe with. And we need to get in environments that we feel safe with. One of the things that we're talking about now with our church is that we want our church to be a safe place where people can work through their issues of their faith. And so, y'all, they go into the upper room. The Bible says they're in one accord. They offer prayer and they offer supplication. Now, now it's not a guarantee that everybody in the upper room, that all of them going to stay on your side. Because if you look on the list, no, Judas on the list. But I need at least to get in a place, first of all, where I can process what in the world is going on in my life. I want you to think about what's happening. They just got done staring up. They just, they, can you imagine you have a conversation with Jesus and then he just start floating up? And they staring. And, and then this is what they get told. Don't worry about that. The same way he go up, he going to come back in, in like manner. Then they leave and they go into the upper room. And you know they got to be like, what in the world did we just see? Sometimes when God is moving in your life, not everybody can help you process it. And so I had to be very careful about who I allow myself to stay attached to. Can I minister to somebody? Everybody can't handle your marriage problems. Because once you and your wife make up, they still mad. And so I got to be careful who I allow into my inner circle so that who's processing what I'm dealing with. I mean, let me, let me just minister this just for a minute, y'all. You know, I, I have a small group of pastors that I just got to tell them about y'all. Because, you know, I'd be like, boy, these, whew, these folk the Lord gave me. And, like, I got I to gotta learn, I got to process in a safe place. I don't need to process with somebody who's going to call y'all up and say, no, he, he, he ready to quit. You need to come on over to my church. <laughs> like, I need to process. I want y'all to get this. I have to process. Yo, it ain't always perfect at home. I wish I had married folks saying amen. I know that's right. But you got to be careful who you let know you're struggling because they might be pushed up on your man. Right? So you got to be really cautious. But if you notice, in order for them to get where God wants them, they had to identify a place they could get to and to get around people to process what is happening. Are y'all hearing me? Not only do I need to get around a safe place to process, but I have to get around a safe place to plan what I'm going to do next. And everybody can't handle Let me Let me go. Somebody go ahead and say this. Some of us, Mel, are not nearly as good as we could be. And folk can't stand you like you are. Imagine you a little bit better. Imagine you a little bit stronger. See, everybody can't handle the plans you're thinking about. They can't handle the stuff that's being processed. You know, I, I, folk looking at me sideways, you know, this year, it will happen this year, mark my words, we'll present it to you probably before the end of the second quarter. This year, we will open a trust fund. World Tabernacle Church will have a trust fund. And because and, we're going to stop spending the money in the bank. And we're going to start spending the interest money of our investments. Now, people hear that and they're like, whatever. But I'm telling you, the day is going to come where God is going to take us even further than we are. Right. And so you got to be careful who you who you share your plans with. So I need a safe place to process. I need a safe place to plan. And then I need a safe place for my partners. They were safe around people that they were doing with. They, they felt comfortable partnering with this group of people. And I need to be careful who I let do life, who I let myself do life with. Right? And so they have a safe place, and I'm done. A supernatural foundation, a specific assignment. And here's the last thing that develops their, their potential. They have a sacred practice. Everybody shout prayer. If you notice in verse number 14, it says, these all continued with one accord. Everybody say in prayer. I want to speak this over somebody's life. 
whatever's going to happen in your life is going to happen after you pray. I'm going to say it one more time. It's going to happen after you pray. That we all need to develop a sacred practice of praying. Y'all, let me hear me about the church. The church was founded on their knees. That's how the church got founded. It didn't get founded while music was going. It found it when people were on their knees praying. And y'all, we have to develop the practice of prayer. The church should always be found on our knees. And as Christians, we've got to spend time and effort on our prayer life. Y'all, it's been said that armies fight on their stomachs, which means hungry soldiers aren't strong. In the same way that armies fight on their stomachs, Christians fight on their knees. We fight praying. And we have to, in 2023, develop the practice of our prayer life. If we're going to advance, we're going to advance on our knees. Amen, Pastor. Let me just rattle this off real quick and I'm done. As we begin studying, we won't get to all of this. You're going to see example upon example in the book of Acts that almost every chapter shows somebody praying. Every time you look up, you're going to see that the feature is somebody's praying. We've already seen reference to it in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, we see people praying again. Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, prayed while he was being stoned. Peter and John prayed for the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. Saul of Tarsus prayed after his conversion in Acts chapter 9. Peter prayed before he raised Dorcas from the dead in Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Cornelius prayed that God would show him how to be saved in Acts chapter 10. Peter was on the housetop praying when God told him how to be the answer to Cornelius' prayer in Acts chapter 10. The believers in John Mark's house prayed for Peter while he was in prison in Acts chapter 12. The church at Antioch fasted and prayed before they sent out Barnabas and Paul in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. It was at a prayer meeting in Philippi that God opened up Lydia's heart in Acts chapter 16. Paul prayed for his friends before leaving leaving them in Acts chapter 20 and it's in the midst of a storm that he prayed for God's blessing in Acts 27 and it's after a storm that he would pray that God would heal the sick man in Acts chapter 28. The whole book is a book on prayer and I believe if some of us are in church today saying God when are you going to do it? God is saying when you going to pray about it. Prayer used to be so important that we used to sing about prayer in church. Somebody prayed for me, had me on my mind, took a little time and prayed for me. They'd add a chorus, the preacher prayed for me. They'd add another line, my mama prayed for me. And then, then there was this old hymn we used to sing. I'm closing, we're going to sing it together. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And then the chorus is saying, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. <laughs> While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Y'all, as we prepare to close service, I want us as a congregation with just one voice to sing a chorus of that song. So, Audrey, Rachel, come on, help us sing this together. But come on, y'all, I want everybody to stand in the room. And, and y'all, let's just sing a verse of... Pass me not. Oh, pass me not, oh, gentle Savior. Hear my humble Come on, y'all, one voice, Savior. One crying Savior. Oh, Savior. Leave me my humble cry. Oh, while all others thou art born.
Come on, let's do that chorus again, Savior, with no music. Come on, just every voice in the house. Oh, crying Savior. Savior.